Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? My name is Prince Coley, and I'm a senior here at Richmond Hill High School. In my four years here, I have seen a lot of positive changes that reflect of our principal Neil Ganesh's vision. One noticeable change is the Are You Green campaign, which allows the students to track their progress through high school. Teachers, guidance counselors, and staff members are available to help us with academics and personal issues. Parents have become more involved with keeping their child on the right track. The students, the faculty, everyone can tell that things are getting better. But the progress is just beginning. With sufficient time, Richmond Hill High School has endless possibilities for student growth and achievement. In my opinion, if you come back here three years from now, you will see a whole new Richmond Hill High School. We are proud of our school and our community. We would like to thank Mayor Bill de Blasio, Superintend Superintendent Amy Horowitz, and our principal Neil Ganesh for believing in us and giving us the necessary tools for success. I also want to give a special thanks to all the teachers and the staff at Richmond Hill for guiding us throughout our high school years. Lastly, I want to thank Ms. Rossiello from the Science Department for being such kind-hearted women and supportive and providing all the support that we needed to get through all our years. Lastly, I'd like to say, go Lions. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Prince, congratulations. It is not easy to get up and speak before members of the press and a crowd like this. It proves that your experience at Richmond Hill has been a very good one, and I appreciate you for all you're doing to further yourself, and I also appreciate you for thanking a teacher that you care about, and we have to always take time to thank teachers for all they do, so thank you, and congratulations to you as well. <laughs> Great job, and glad, Prince, that you are experiencing uh, some of the changes, some of the improvements, and it's helping you, and it's helping your classmates. So, it is a pleasure to be here at Richmond Hill High School, and as Prince said, home of the lions, and the lion imagery is going to figure into my remarks again later. It's important in this school. This is one of 94 renewal schools across the city. It's part of a $150 million initiative that we've undertaken to help schools that need help, to turn them around, to make them strong again. We announced this back in November, and we have been implementing this initiative very, very aggressively. And with each uh, succeeding month, you will see more and more and more action in these 94 schools. Today, I visited two classrooms, talked to students and teachers, and we saw education moving forward. We saw kids engaged in learning and teachers who are committed, and that is what we need to invest in, and that's what we will invest in. We see the educational process working. We invest more deeply. That's our commitment. I want to say at the outset, I'm very, very appreciative of the efforts of our principal, Neil Ganesh. Had a great talk with him about the approach he's taking to turning around this school now. Um, there are many great school leaders in this city, but there's a characteristic I particularly love in a school leader. It's when that school leader comes from the community they serve. Born and raised in Richmond Hill, correct? Born and raised in Richmond Hill, now serving his community. Took over the school in October of 2013. Has done a great job at increasing attendance at this school and uh, adding to the ability of each student to gain the credits they need for graduation. This is a big part of the Renewal School's effort, to do much better at connecting students to the credits they need for graduation. We talked about this back at Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn, how a lot of kids were not getting the support and the guidance they needed to actually take the right classes for graduation. That's how hands-off the situation had become. Now, at Boys and Girls, a very focused effort, student by student, to make sure they get what they need for graduation. I know that the principal here is very devoted. In fact, as we walked in, he showed me the charts, and to all my friends in the media, if you haven't seen them, you should look at them. You walk through the hallways, a chart of literally every student. Instead of their name, there is a code number indicating to them who they are, but not to anyone else. 
and it literally shows how they are doing on the pathway to graduation. That is true for 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade students. So any student in this school can see at any given moment if they are on track for graduation or not. Any teacher, any administrator can see how each student is doing. It's literally in front of your faces. It's like the war room that Amy has started, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it's being done at the school level, literally student by student. So I want to emphasize, when we talk about renewal schools, this is very personal. We are literally going and reaching out to each and every student in a renewal school to make sure they're on the right track. We are going to win this student by student. Just as Amy is picking, keeping track of all 94 renewal schools and helping them with the efforts they need to turn around, principals like Neil Ganesh are monitoring each and every student and helping them to get what they need and pushing them to go farther. And I think that is the key to victory. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone at the DOE who is a part of this effort. Obviously, Chancellor Farina considers this a crucial element of our work and our mission. Amy Horowitz, everyone is starting to get to know, a great veteran a teacher who became an administrator. She was a great success as a teacher. She was a great success as an administrator, turning around schools, starting new programs that worked. She is here as the executive superintendent for renewal schools because she's walked the walk, because she has figured out in her own work how to make schools work. And now we're asking her to lead the effort on a so much larger level. She is the general of the army. She is the one who's going to marshal the forces to turn these 94 schools around. And she will have my full support in that effort. Uh, let's talk about the history. I think it's important to acknowledge. There was a different policy before we came here. It was a policy that focused on the closing of schools. A lot of parents didn't like that. A lot of communities didn't like that, for good reason. Because in many cases, I want to welcome Assemblyman David Weprin, how you doing? Good. Welcome. Uh, the reason there was such uh, frustration over the closing of schools was that in many cases the schools were closed before any coherent effort to turn them around was mounted. Once upon a time we had the Chancellor's District, which was a serious effort to concentrate resources on schools that needed help, but that effort was never sustained. And so schools that were struggling, instead of having an action plan, were left to get worse in many cases. And then there was, I think, often a rush to close them to, in theory, go to other options that might be better. But as we saw in many cases, sometimes the options were good, sometimes they weren't. We also saw a lot of kids in that process of closure were left in the lurch. A lot of kids were in the phase-out years and those phase-out years were not good educational experiences for the children. We came along with a different philosophy. We said, if we've only scratched the surface of actually trying to turn around a school, let's show you what it would look like if you concentrated all of your resources on the schools that needed them the most. In some schools, as I've said, there will be a new principal and other new leaders. Where that's needed, we will not hesitate to replace principals and bring in new leaders. In some schools, we will need master teachers and model teachers, the new categories that we achieved in the contract with the teachers union that elevates those teachers who are most effective to a higher status where they get more pay to take their skills and their ability to coach and coach other teachers to get better. So in some schools, we will send in a SWAT team, as it were, of new principal, new assistant principal, new teachers, depending on what mix we need, we will mobilize the best talent we have and send them where the need is greatest. We will add instructional time in each and every one of these 94 schools. Every one of them, for every child, will have an additional period of instruction in the school day. We're adding after school to every single one of them. Every single one of them will be a community school, meaning they will have additional physical and mental health capacity. They will have additional parental involvement, additional community involvement, tutoring programs, et cetera. All of these pieces are going to be brought to bear simultaneously. A lot of those pieces are being moved right this minute in these schools. We will keep adding and adding as we build out the renewal schools program. So a renewal school will have more investment of more different kinds than we've ever attempted with our schools who needed the most help. We believe this will be transcendent. We believe it will be transcendent very quickly. And we're going to hold ourselves to account in a transparent manner. We know who is personally accountable, and she is accountable to the chancellor and me. 
and we're going to literally go school by school and report constantly on the progress we are making. The problem of the past is it suggested that we should, we should surrender rather than fight. We believe in fighting to turn around schools. Now, I said when I announced this plan in November, if you take every conceivable research, resource and apply it to the situation, you need to see results quickly. And I said the outer limit I will give is three years during this term. If I do not see a school turn around significantly in three years, I will close it down, and I will be accountable for that decision. But I believe with the kind of resources we are putting into play and the kind of leadership that you're going to see these schools move and move quickly. That is the vision. We want to send a message to the people who do the work, to the teachers and all the other people in the school community that we value them and we're investing in them. We especially want to send a message to students like Prince that we're not giving up on them and their school. In fact, we're bringing more in to help them succeed. I think our students deserve that support and that commitment. This is going to be across the city, 94 schools, it's going to be concentrated. It's going to be energetic. We want these schools to reach their full potential. Let's talk about the experience in this school where we see such promising signs already. The principal, I've already bragged on you and what you've done in your leadership. Also, as part of this effort, a leadership coach has been assigned, Stephen Dutch, retired principal, who turned around previously another troubled school. So we bring in, we have a great young principal who's making things happen. We're bringing in coaching and support for him to learn some of the specific strategies that have worked to turn around schools previously. We're adding here already, they've added after school and Saturday sessions. So depending on the student, whatever additional instruction and support they need, they can get it after school or they can get it on Saturdays. That is happening right now. The arts program in this school was saved from being cut because that's the kind of effort that helps elevate the students and their love of learning. So at a school that needs extra energy and extra motivation for success, don't take away the kind of program that actually moves students the most. So that's why we save the arts program here. There's a new training program for ninth grade teachers to help them focus on the need to teach kids how to write better. So part of what we've said system-wide is we're going to focus on teacher training. That's a core part of the contract deal, more time into training. But the training effort, as Amy can describe, is particularly important where the need is greatest. So there's an incessant uh, ability for a principal to say, okay, I've got these committed teachers, but they need coaching. In a certain areas, we're going to give them that additional training. We know writing is one of the biggest challenges, by the way, in our whole society. We are going to help these teachers learn better how to write. I just want to make an analogy, given the season we're in. It's spring training. And we, I think, don't talk about teaching properly. Because if you look at Major League Baseball, these wonderful professionals, they take batting practice every single day. They talk to their hitting coach every single day or their pitching coach, and we think that's normal. They make millions and millions of dollars of the best there is in the world, and they get coached every single day. Why should it be any different for our teachers? We have the best and most motivated teachers, but they still need constant help and support from the principal and assistant principals. They need constant training. They need to improve at all times. By the way, the vast majority of our teachers want to improve. They are professionals. They're committed to their craft. They want to get better all the time. A lot of them want to become master teachers. A lot of them want to become assistant principals and principals. We've made that pathway more available to them. So there's a lot of reasons for teachers to really work hard at becoming the best professionals they can be, and that's something we're going to particularly emphasize here in a renewal school. So here at Richmond Hill, the extra resources, the new programming, the support, the training is already having an impact. In terms of students on track, to graduate, we see a 7% increase across all grade levels of students now on track to graduate. Again, you can see it on the charts in the hallways. 83 more kids in the 11th grade alone are now on track to graduate compared to last year. That's a 20% improvement. The enrollment in after-school programs has almost tripled from 143 students to 413. Again, if a kid's in an after-school program, they are learning they're getting more motivation, they're getting more time on task. Another important indicator 
of a school community that's getting stronger and more orderly. Serious or violent incidents are down from this time this year compared to last time, uh, this time last year. An inc important decrease in serious and violent incidents, an uh, important decrease in suspensions. So the school is becoming more orderly, more committed. What I mentioned about the hallways and the posters you see, it's got a very simple concept to it. The, the uh, slogan is, are you green? If you look on these charts, again, every single student visible, if you have green all across your chart, it means you are totally on track to graduate. If you have yellow in certain areas, it means there's work to be done. If you have red, it means there's a more serious problem that has to be addressed. So the question being asked of everyone is, are you green? Are you on track? Are you up to date? Is everything moving? And that sends a powerful message of accountability up and down the line. And it also gives the students ability to see with their own eyes where they stand. It makes them accountable in a good way as well. All of this is about helping the school succeed and the students succeed. We're seeing it here, and we're seeing it at renewal schools around the city. Boys and girls, a lot of you were there. You heard the story of increased attendance, more kids on track to graduate, more spirit in the school that things were turning around, great new leadership by a principal who also had a history of turning around schools, all of those pieces adding up. Now, if you say, what do we need to go farther? What we need to go farther is to get that which we should have gotten years and years ago from Albany, which is the money that the New York State Court of Appeals said the city of New York deserves for our schools. If there are controversies over this question, I remind everyone of a simple concept. I didn't make up this number. Amy Horowitz didn't make up this number. Carmen Farina didn't make up this number. The New York State Court of Appeals dictated in 2007 what... New York City should get. Where are we compared to where we should be? I'm sorry, 2006, 2006. Where are we compared to where we should be? Well, this year alone, if the law of this state was being followed, if the Court of Appeals decision was being honored, we would get $2.6 billion more for our schools, which would have an absolutely transcendent effect on our ability to rise up all our kids and have a school system that is strong across the board, $2.6 billion. In the past, folks in Albany used to say, because of the economic crisis and other challenges, that they were in deficit. This year, the state of New York has an almost $8 billion surplus. It's a matter of public record. It's time for New York City to get its fair share. And what that would do at Richmond Hill and so many of these schools would be transcendent. What it would do for our 171,000 special ed kids, what it would do for kids who right now need guidance so they can move forward in their lives in the college. I think you've heard that we have one guidance counselor for every, I think it's 392 kids in our high schools. There are so many fundamental changes we could make if we had the resources. Uh, to conclude, before turning to Neil and Amy, uh, this school, you can feel that something good is happening here, and they have a powerful slogan uh, to drive themselves forward. The slogan is transform yourself. That's a statement to everyone in the school community, and it's a statement to uh, the individual students. There is a poster that you see around here, and it's a poster of a cat looking into a mirror. And in the mirror, the cat sees a lion. I foreshadowed that for those of you who teach English. That was foreshadowing. Uh, the cat sees a lion, sees the unleashing of his inner potential. That's what we want to see for every student here, that's what we want to see for every renewal school, and we will not stop fighting until that is done. En español, estamos viendo grandes avances en escuelas públicas con problemas gracias al programa de renovación escolar. Los nuevos recursos están ayudando a mejorar el desempeño académico y la asistencia escolar. Se, se, excuse me, seguiremos apoyando a estas escuelas porque cada niño merece una buena educación. So we are committed to these schools. We know we can turn them around. And I want you to hear from the principal of this school. I want you to hear his story of what he has done already and how he is committed to the community he grew up in, because I think it's a great example of where we're going as a city. Principal Neil Ganesh.
Uh, good afternoon. I would first like to thank the mayor for his kind words and for visiting us here today. Richmond Hill High School has a long-standing history of being a community high school with over 100 years of history and tradition. And it is our expectation that it will continue to serve this community in a successful manner. With the hard work and dedication of our staff and the support of our mayor, our chancellor, and our superintendent, we are making great progress here at Richmond Hill. In our tour today, we were able to walk around and see the implementation of a new instructional strategy, and the renewal team has been working collabor collaboratively to integrate, help us integrate it with our teachers. We have seen the fruits um, and positive progress in terms of the implementation of this strategy, along with the work of the re renewal team uh, by justification or uh, evidenced by student engagement. Uh, our students today were actively engaged in, in the lessons. Our teachers were using the strategy, um, and we observed that in our visits in, in the two classrooms that we saw today. We were also able to view our Are You Green campaign, as the, as the mayor mentioned. It allows for our students to individually track their progress towards graduation. Uh, and, and as he mentioned, it was on an individual basis. Green means good, good to, good to go, or on track for graduation. Yellow means needs improvement. And red means seek help immediately. These initiatives ha have helped to create a positive tone and instill pride and enthusiasm in our students that were not here prior to my tenure as principal. Our dedicated faculty, in collaboration with the renewal team, have worked throughout the year to identify individual student needs based on inquiry and student assessment and modify instruction based on these individual needs. Because of this work, we are pleased with the progress in terms of student achievement. Our school credit accumulation is up, attendance is up, and suspensions are down because of the approach and the strategies that we have implemented. I believe that we are seeing positive results because of the main concept behind the program. The main concept is building a strong community school. One of my first objectives as leader of the school was to reach out to the community, and I will continue to reach out to engage the community. As principal, I firmly believe that in order for Richmond Hill High School to continue to achieve success, Richmond Hill High School needs the community, and the community needs Richmond Hill High School. We are working diligently to forge relationships with community partners, leaders, and parents to transform Richmond Hill High School into the school that we know it should be and will be. I want to thank again the mayor and Superintendent Horowitz for their support, and I look forward to future visits to highlight the progress that we will see here at Richmond Hill High School. Thank you so much. So as I said, to put this into military terms, Amy Horowitz is the general of the Army, and she is the person mounting this huge effort. And we have a war room, which I think you've heard about, where we are now mapping out each and every piece of the Renewal School's effort. We are going to borrow from a great New York success story, which is Comstat, and use the same approaches to turning around these schools this very morning. Superintendent Horowitz was at Comstat at NYPD, uh, working with the leadership at NYPD about how to adopt the approach uh, and use it in the case of the renewal schools. So we're going to hold every one of the principals to the same kind of standards that our precinct commanders are held to via Comstat. They will get the same kind of forceful questioning, and they'll also get the support to succeed. But we're going to make this a very urgent effort and Amy will have the ability to track each and every one of the schools, the ability to call in the school leaders on a rotating basis, as is done at Comstat, question them, find out what they need, push them harder, make sure they're doing their job. And if she doesn't see what she likes, just as at the NYPD, there's a whole host of actions that can be taken to improve the situation and to address the leadership dynamic. That's how urgent this is going to be. Again, we have the right woman for the job, Executive Superintendent Amy Horowitz.
Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. Um, I'm so excited to be here at Richmond Hill just to see the progress in the short amount of time that we've been working with this school, and I am very excited to be engaged in this important and urgent work. Um, school renewal is already underway here at Richmond Hill and also at 93 other schools across the city. My team, superintendents and their teams, and I are in schools every day embedded in the work we are doing, embedded in the work they are doing with us. We began our work with comprehensive evaluations of our schools to assess their needs and are now providing them, as you heard, with customized supports to improve student outcomes. Specifically, we've identified that renewal high schools are struggling with teaching and assessing writing as a pattern across all of our schools. We are now providing ongoing teacher training with cutting edge strategies to improve student writing across all subjects. My team, school leaders, and teachers are all collaborating on this important effort. Teacher teams are now engaged in the evidence-based practice of evaluating and reviewing student work through inquiry to understand what works and what doesn't and what they need to change in their individual practice so that they can improve student achievement in their classrooms. In many of the Renewal High Schools, including Richmond Hill, we are already seeing improvements in leading indicators of school performance, as you heard, including credit accumulation, increased attendance, increased regents passing rates, and parent engagement. Most importantly, we see improved leadership practice, improved teacher practice, and increased student engagement and outcomes, particularly in speaking and writing using evidence from text. Richmond Hill is a great example with strong leadership from Principal Ganesh, emphasis on writing strategies, and a focus on motivating students through the Are You Green campaign. Credit accumulation is up 8%. At a school with over 2,000 students, that's a big, big deal. As a mom, as a teacher, as a principal, and now as a superintendent for the past four years, I understand the importance and the urgency of this work at Richmond Hill and at renewal schools across the city. I know that we don't have any time to waste or any effort to spare. I'm holding my principals accountable to me, and I expect that they hold their teachers accountable to them. And I'll hold myself accountable to our mayor, to our chancellor, and to school communities for ensuring that our schools improve and that our students are coming to school, accumulating credits, and are on the path to post-secondary readiness for any college or career they desire to pursue. Our students deserve no less. I know that as a city, we can do this and we will do this. Thank you. I want to thank Assemblyman David Weprin for being here. We served in the city council together and have worked together very closely over the years. He is now in Albany and he is fighting for the interests of our children in Albany every day, and I want to thank him for that. Assemblymember David Weprin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Superintendent Horowitz, for coming. And uh, I've um, been dealing with uh, Principal uh, Neil Ganesh uh, for the last couple of years, and he's doing a great job in uh, turning around this uh, school, uh, which has, as, as the principal mentioned, uh, over a 100-year history um, as, as a great institution, and uh, Hopefully, we'll continue uh, for another 100 years. I was a little late because I came down from Albany. Uh, I, I didn't slow down until I got to New York City limits, Mr. Mayor. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, um, we've been fighting every day in the Democratic Conference. Uh, our number one priority uh, has been uh, New York City schools and education in general. But since the uh, New York City members dominate uh, the Democratic Conference in the Assembly, We've been fighting so hard for CFE. There hasn't been a day that has gone by 
uh, in the assembly where we haven't mentioned in conference how important it is to get the CFE money. Uh, I, we'd love to put the $2.6 million, $2.6 billion budget uh, money that's owed to us, uh, you know, in the budget. We, we did put a billion dollars in our one house budget, specifically earmarked for CFE, plus a $1.8 uh, billion in addition uh, to the governor's proposal. Uh, you know, we've been fighting uh, some of the governor's proposals, and that's, if the budget is late, well, I don't expect it to be, I expect it to be on time, but if it is late, it's going to be because of the education proposals. And we've been fighting against the receivership, uh, we've been fighting uh, for mayoral control, and the Senate version uh, left out mayoral control completely. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's not as easy to govern in Albany when you have three to tango, the governor, uh, the assembly, and the Senate. It was a little easier. Uh, in the city, uh, but uh, certainly I can tell you, uh, speaking uh, on behalf of the Democratic Conference in the Assembly, uh, you know, we're going to be fighting uh, every day until the budget and uh, hopefully um, even afterwards uh, on some of these uh, proposals. But I have to say, uh, Mayor de Blasio, uh, on this issue in particular, is such a breath of fresh air. Uh, we had been fighting um, under his predecessor, under the Bloomberg administration, to maintain some of these historic schools, these large schools, and we kept saying all they need is the resources to turn them around, and they were denied those resources. I'm a graduate of Jamaica High School. Uh, Jamaica High School is in my district. There was a decision made uh, in the prior administration to close these schools uh, without benefit uh, of the data, without benefit of the resources. And I have to say, uh, it really pained me to speak at the last Jamaica High School graduation last year when we were down to 24 students. And when I graduated, there were 1,000 students. And uh, I, you know, I know the trend has been for smaller high schools, but uh, Jamaica High School, like Richmond Hill High School, uh, had uh, you know, this history. And uh, I think if Mayor de Blasio had been in there before the decision was made, I think we could have saved Jamaica High School as well. But I'm certainly uh, pleased that uh, Richmond Hill High School is on the uh, path uh, to uh, recovery and, uh, and succeed. And anything I can do to help, Mr. Mayor, I'd love to do. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. We are going to take on topic questions. Um, I'm wondering if Superintendent Horowitz first can discuss her meeting at the NYPD, who she met with, how long she was there, what, what she learned. Um, and second, if you can talk about what will actually happen at these CompStat-like meetings. Who will be there? Will all 94 principals be there? Who will grill them? What are the metrics you'll be looking at, et cetera? So I want to just start, and I'll pass it again. Uh, superintendent has been given a very big job, and she's acclimating to it very quickly. But not every detail is resolved yet. I want to say at the outset, I'm going to be seeing Chief O'Neill later today, who runs the CompStat sessions with our Deputy Commissioner for Operations, Dermot Shea. And I'm going to ask both of them to put some personal time into supporting uh, the superintendent in terms of understanding what has been effective in the Comstat system. So today was a chance for her to acclimate to the system, but there will be follow-up meetings in terms of how to actually use it in a new context. Uh, second, in terms of all of the metrics for each of the schools, that's being assembled now. But the point is we're going to use a very rigorous system where every school is going to have to be accountable to the superintendent on a regular basis. Do you want to add? So today was um, a chance for me to observe the CompStat process and have brief conversations with some of the people that run the meeting along with two other people from the DOE so that we can continue to put together our war room. We had our first war room meeting yesterday and superintendents presented to the DOE um, education uh, senior level um, People from all departments, including youth development, Mark Rampersant was there, Jarita Gibson was there, people from teaching and learning, Anna Comitante was there, to do um, a case kind of conference where they presented about what's going on in their schools and a problem of practice so that we could question and offer possible solutions. And we had various um, superintendents there. This was the first time that we had done it. We had five superintendents there moving forward. We will have fewer superintendents so that we can have a more in-depth analysis and more time for question and answers. So we've already um, reflected on that process and then went to CompStat today to learn more about um, what we can learn from that very successful process to move forward and to see people ask the difficult questions. And I'm not afraid to ask the difficult questions. Let me just add an additional piece. This is that exact process. You know, what's so powerful in CompStat is you take 
uh, a set of statistics from the precinct that then immediately go into a conversation about individual cases and individual circumstances and what the leadership does, in this case, Chief O'Neill and uh, Deputy Commissioner Shea, as they drill down into the individual situation. Uh, there was a pattern of robberies. What did you do? You know, how did you investigate? How many people did you apply to it? What did you find? Did you pursue this lead? Did you coordinate with this other part of the equation? And they put the leadership of the precinct through their paces, and they're looking for, in each case, who's on the ball, who's got the right plan, who's following through fully, or are there things where there's areas of weakness that have to be addressed or new practices that need to be brought to bear? That's exactly what Amy already instinctively was starting to do with the superintendents and with the principals, but we're going to systematize that even further and just like in Comstat, rotate each school through to explain what they're doing and have to present their success and their practice and be critiqued, and then they have to come back and show that they've taken the critique and put it into action. Whose idea was this? So this idea was actually um, conceived by myself and a couple of members of my, of my team. So um, my team is amazing. They are really strong, smart, educated people that care about schools, that have sat in the seat of principals and that are in schools every day. And so we look at that and look at what helped us grow as educators and what we can do moving forward. number of schools in the city have been, and elsewhere in the state, have been struggling for too long, and he needs the option, the state needs the option to put some of these schools into receivership. What do you think of that proposal and his reasoning? I think we have a very rigorous plan to turn these schools around. It was published in November. It is now being acted on, as you can see, with great energy and with a lot of resources uh, and more to come. Uh, we have mayoral control of education, which means the buck stops right here. Uh, and I am absolutely and totally personally accountable. And as I said in my budget testimony in Albany, uh, I have a contract. It comes up for renewal in November 2017. If I don't produce, the people can replace me. That's the, the beauty of mayoral control of education. So uh, to me, when you have a mayoral control system with absolute clear authority, when we have produced a clear plan for turning around the 94 schools with resources attached and leadership that's actually done the work. What's important then is to let us do our work. Uh, I'm not going to comment on other school systems with other approaches, but where mayoral control of education exists and you have an absolutely clear chain of command, absolutely clear accountability, the state should simply let us get our job done. Um, you talked about some of the supports that Richmond Hill has got and the progress they've made so far. Um, and that includes leadership coaching, teacher coaches, the learning program. But I've talked to other schools in the renewal program that haven't had that type of support yet. I just talked to an administrator today who said they really haven't had any support in the building so far. So how many out of the 94 renewal schools have had this level of support? So I'm going to ask Amy to you know, begin to outline that, but let me just start by saying this is a program that we announced in November that we are very energetically applying through 94 schools. Now, 94 schools, one of which here, 2,000 students, you know, 94 schools, some of which have this number of students, would be the size of an entire school system of a major American city. So I just want people to understand how fast and intense this effort is, but also how big uh, a playing field we're working on here. But you're going to see pieces of this program in place across the board through this school year. September, in particular, you're going to see a whole new reality in a lot of these schools as we apply the elements of the program intensely. But why don't you speak to how many are at what point of development? So I am going to say that there are various stages of development, but every school has been visited and has gotten feedback at least from their superintendent, and many of the superintendents have visited their schools and provided feedback more than once, doing walkthroughs with the principal and assistant principals, looking at the um, classroom instruction. They've been visited by talent coaches to work on instruction and looking at implementation of Danielson with fidelity and also looking at how to provide teachers with actionable feedback. In addition, there is a renewal team that has visited um, schools, senior, deputy, senior leadership from the Department of Education, including the deputy chancellors, have each adopted a school 
and the vast majority of them had visited their schools and are engaging in those visits today. I know Dorita Gibson is at a school today, and I know that Deputy Chancellor Phil Weinberg will be visiting very many of the high schools. I've been in 14 of the high schools extensively, along with members of my team. And while not every school has a coach embedded in the school, it takes time also to find the right people. So just this week, two, new, two additional high schools in Queens got principal leadership coaches because we found the right person. Can't just be any retired principal. It has to be someone that can do the job. Delineate what will be uh, across the board in September so people can hear that. So in September, every renewal school will be a community school. The schools right now are engaging in the process of interviewing community-based organizations to be their chief partners. Those people will be sitting at the table with the school, the school in conjunction with their school leadership team and other school constituents have the option of choosing a community-based organization that was vetted through a very rigorous process to, um, to interview and to be the chief partner in that school so that they can provide wraparound services to students. What's different about this than just having a community-based organization in the school, as many of our schools do, is that there will now be a community coordinator. And so those community-based education, those community-based organizations will be embedded in the culture of the school, will sit at the table with educators. So it won't just be an after-school arts program, but they will discuss with educators what the students need and how we can all coordinate the services so that students' needs are met. Let me, let me jump in and then we'll, in a second, let me comment on this and then I want you also to go over how the extra instructional time will be added in after-school, et cetera. This point's very important. I want you to go back to what we talked about, the, the charts on the wall of this school. This is a different approach. I need everyone to understand this is not yesterday's approach. This is a different approach. This is student by student. So everything, Amy is an expert in education, uses some of the terms that may be less accessible to those of us who are not uh, uh, teaching professionals, but I want to put it into a little plainer English. All of this is about how you literally track every student in your school and help them to achievement. It is about improving the work of the teachers. It is about improving what the leadership can do, in some cases meaning new leadership, in some cases meaning supporting the leadership we have, in some cases new teachers or teachers who have reached master or model teacher level, in some cases supporting the teachers we have or any combination thereof. But it really comes down to uh, incessant focus on each student. So when we talk about community schools, that sounds a little abstract at first blush. Here's what it means. If a student has a health care need, if they have a physical health care need, if they have a mental health care need, it will be dealt with in school. If a student needs tutoring, there will be volunteers from the community to tutor them. If a student needs more uh, coordination between their parent and their teacher, the parent will be called into the school because now we've given teachers a lot more time to focus on parent engagement and getting on the same page strategically. Sometimes, the breakthrough for a kid will be if the parent is really on top of them about doing their homework, if the parent's reading with them, whatever it may be, teachers need that partner at home to maximize the educational strategy. So it's a very different approach. It's much more urgent. It's much more hands-on. It's much more student by student. The history of this city is not a pretty one. Many students were left without the support they deserve. Many parents were left disengaged. Schools were written off. I've said it many times. The status quo that we have received is unacceptable. We won't, we won't stand for it. When you really rework the process, it is, you know, the educational equivalent of house-to-house -house combat. You are literally working with every student and every family to turn around what is ultimately a system of 1.2 million kids. I know this as a public school parent. I know this from my days on the school board in Community, 15, uh, community School District 15 in Brooklyn where you'd literally understand from educators what they needed to succeed. You'd hear from teachers what they wish they could do to better their efforts on behalf of their own children. We're trying to put all those pieces together with urgency. But you're going to see the kind of approach that Neil Ganesh has, Ganesh has done here, where you literally can chart the progress of every single kid. That's totally ComStat, if you think about it. That is, a, that is taking the concept, ComStat, ComStat concept and applying it very, very energetically, right down to the micro level of how are we doing with each child. Why don't you talk about what else happens in September in terms of school day, after school, et cetera? 
So by September, every school will have an added hour of extra learning time for every student in the school. Currently, 54 of our schools have built that into their schedule, and that can be done through teacher flex time. It can be done through procession. There are various ways that schools can choose to do that. Terms again. Okay. It can be done by paying teachers at an hourly rate to stay. There are various, there are various ways to do that, but in the renewal program, we are committed to every school having an extra hour of instruction a day for every student so that our students can spend more time learning, whether they're a struggling student that needs an intervention or a student in, a, in an advanced level class that can benefit from enrichment. But we know that all of our students do better and succeed at higher levels with more time on task. So what's different about this is the comprehensive approach. It's not just we're providing teachers with coaching or providing principals with coaching or we're turning the school into a community school. It takes all of that into consideration so that we're attacking the problem and the issues from every single angle. I just want to make one other point. 54 of the 94 have that extra period of instruction right now, the rest by September. Again, in September, every school gets after-school programs as well for any student who needs it. So this is a lot of layering here. Related question, because you're talking about how you won't shy away from replacing a principal or a teacher if necessary. So last month you told Albany that you had moved out mm -hmm. 300 teachers. From 291 the at that day, yes. Okay. 97 of those left because of severance. The yep. city reported that. Of the remaining 200 or so, was a single one of them removed because of disciplinary proceedings? I'll get you the breakout, but I said there in Albany very clearly. We use disciplinary proceedings. We use uh, coaching people out of the profession who shouldn't be in it. Uh, some choose to resign. Some take severance. The issue here is what's going to get it done. Now, we believe fundamentally that we need a better, faster approach to discipline, and we're moving a lot of those pieces as well. But that is one of the tools. Whatever gets someone who does not belong in the profession out as quickly as possible, we're going to use that tool. 291 between April uh, and th that point it was February uh, is an example of the pace we're now starting to sustain and making the moves we have to make very quickly. But did anybody get Again, moved I'll out? get you the breakout. I'm not familiar with how it breaks out. Most of them left because of retirement, and maybe that's a good approach too. I mean, what, is, what does that say this is, about you? No, uh, that, is, that group of folks are the folks, again, who we had purposefully believed needed to move along. The retirement happens all the time in this system. This is about the 291 folks specifically, for one reason or another, were helped out of the profession. So none of them retired? Again, they may have retired because we help them out of the profession. There's, as the chancellor has been very clear about counseling some people who do not belong in the profession or are not performing any longer, that it's time to seek another path. I really think this is important, and you know a lot about education, but I, I wish we could demystify this a little bit. There is, as in any other line of work, the possibility of a formal termination proceeding. Uh, it's different depending on the line of work, depending on whether people are unionized or not. We, again, are committed to making that a faster and better process. That is one tool. A lot of times, the better tool, and the commissioner, I mean, excuse me, the chancellor has been really clear about this based on her long history as educator and administrator. If you can counsel someone out, voluntarily skip all that process, you don't belong here anymore. You're a good human being, but you don't belong here anymore. You're not into it. You're burned out. You can't do what we need you to do in this day and age, whatever it is. If that person goes along willingly, that is actually the most efficient way to resolve the problem. Some people come to that conclusion themselves and resign or retire. Some people say, well, if I'm going to take a severance opportunity, that at least makes it easier for me to accept that reality. And that's why we added severance into the teacher contract. About a third of those teachers did take severance, which proved how uh, helpful a tool it was. And we've just gotten started uh, having the ability to use these tools. So we're going to use all of the above. And yes, sometimes there's no choice but to pursue the uh, termination process aggressively and energetically. We want to improve it. We want it to be faster and clearer. But I actually am happier when someone leaves before that process has to be undertaken, if they need to be out of the system. What would be the benchmark or the metrics, say, for this high school here to graduate from the renewal program? 
So I'm going to turn to Amy in just a couple points. Excellent question. First of all, one of the things we're developing is our set of accountability measures for everything we're doing. Uh, so we'll have more to say, and we'll keep publishing those as we go along. And again, we intend to give you a lot of updates on how the schools are going. And you're going to see, I hope, a lot of schools making a lot of progress, and you're going to see some possibly that are not making the progress we want. And I'm going to be very, very clear if I don't see progress, I have the option to move to closure at any point in the next three years. I said that three years was the time frame for final decision, but I'm not ruling out a faster action if I don't see progress. So we're going to develop what we think is the progress within the, school, the renewal schools context. Your question, I think, takes us over the horizon. When is the school so strong again that it's no longer in the program? That obviously in part has to do with state standards, but that is exactly the aspiration to get them to a point where they stand alone and strong. Can you explain the, the state background? So um, one of the things that we are in the process of engaging in right now, recognizing that each of these 94 schools is, although they're all renewal schools, they're all in a different place in their journey towards renewing and being um, sufficient to be taken out of this initiative. So one of the things that we're doing is looking at each school individually based on where they are and developing individual metrics. Also, the state has metrics that they apply. So, for example, in high school, they look at graduation rate, four-year graduation rate, and six-year graduation rate, and they look at performance of various subgroups and progress of various subgroups. And in elementary and middle schools, they look at growth on state tests, ELA and math tests, and in some cases, science tests. So there are kind of two sets of metrics, and we are putting benchmarks into place for schools, both long and short-term benchmarks. Graduation rate, which you mentioned, is a lagging indicator, so we'll be looking first at leading indicators. For example, in high school, ninth grade credit accumulation is one of the leading indicators because all of the research shows that when students earn 10 or more credits in ninth grade, they're much more likely to stay in high school and to graduate high school. So we are figuring all of that, those individual metrics out right now, but um, they will be developed individually by, by school based on where the school is. And the schools will be aware of those targets. Okay, now wait a minute. I, we, are, we need to move to off topic soon, but we do have an unusually high level of interest. So. Let's, we appreciate it, so let's, let's take it a little bit longer, Sally. Yeah, we're on topic, just to kind of we're, continue. This is still on topic for everyone, so I want to gauge on topic interest after your question. Go ahead. Just to kind of continue on what you were saying, in the past, you know, there was some criticism of too much emphasis on school tests and, you know, too much being, too much emphasis being placed on that. Do you see that as being, maybe weighing less into your equation as you decide what schools to either go mainstream or close in the future? I want to turn to Amy and just say this at the outset. We, as an administration, I know the Chancellor feels this very strongly. We believe in multiple measures. We do not believe uh, in overemphasizing high-stakes testing. Uh, and we certainly do not want to see an increase of the use of state testing in the way we evaluate. We think there's a much better, clearer way to understand what's really happening by looking at multiple measures. And that certainly, with everything that we control, that is uh, fully the purview of the City of New York, we will use multiple measures. So as the mayor said, we believe more in a holistic approach and looking at multiple measures. So while there is a role for tests, we also know that there is attendance, we know that there's credit accumulation, we know that there's effective leadership, effective teacher practice. Is the teacher practice improving? Is the leadership practice improving? So those are all things that we can look at. We can speak to students, we can speak to parents. You walk into a school and you feel the climate of the school. If you walk into a school on a day that the mayor is not coming and you walk in, you feel the climate of the school, right? And you know, you can you know if that's a place where you'd want to send your child or you know you know if you feel welcome and we're working with schools on that as well that's also very important so those are all of the things that we look at and speak to speak to many different constituents and that's how my team started this work as well let me add one point on that and it's the comstat parallel again Comstat works not, this is, this is something I think is also underestimated, not just on the numbers. The practice issue is crucial. Uh, I have had the honor over this last 15 months uh, to get deep into conversation with Commissioner Bratton and uh, Chief O'Neill and Deputy Commissioner Shea and listen to them talk about 
their trade and how they are trying to teach their commanders to think you know, very critically about the work they're doing and then teach those under them to do it always in a better and more innovative way. The same is going to be true with teaching. So the numbers tell you a lot, but you're constantly working on the practice. If you see a, a leader, principal in this case, who uh, needs to approach something differently, you can help them think about the problem differently and approach how they orient their teachers, how they train their teachers. Not all that shows up immediately in a, a metric, but that might be the gateway to fundamentally turning around that school. So it's both. It's working on the metrics always, but it's also working on the quality of the practice. Um, this is sort of on topic. The Daily News has this education series. Wondering if you've seen it, what you think no. of it. I think there's a lot of uh, very important material being covered in the Daily News series, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate that also both Chancellor Farina and I were offered an opportunity to uh, provide our views. I also, uh, you know, a lot of times I've said I'd like the discussion on education to deepen, uh, to get into some of the really profound issues we face, like the challenge of teacher retention. <laughs> Literally nothing is more important to the future of our schools than uh, attracting the best teachers, training them effectively, and keeping them. One of our biggest problems is we're losing great teachers all the time. It's true in school systems around the country. That doesn't get addressed, but the teachers who don't belong in the profession get looked at incessantly. I think the Daily News did a service by trying to take a bigger look at the situation. I appreciate how much uh, uh, newspaper real estate was dev uh, devoted to it as well. Wait, who has, anyone who hasn't gone yet on topic hasn't gone. We're going to come to the student journalists. There's a student journalist. Student journalists, we're coming to you at the end. Hold on, Bob. Yeah, I, I, for Principal Ganesh, the metrics you've mentioned about student progress are things that are easy to deliver. In terms of that relationship with parents, what is the thing that you look for? Is it um, back to school participation? Is there some metrics? And then, just so we have a better idea of this place, because we're kind of dropped in here by the band, what percentage of folks uh, is English the primary language when they go home? And how many folks of um, uh, household during free lunch? Give us a percentage. Okay. Um, in terms of measure, measuring uh, parent engagement, there are multiple metrics that we use. Uh, as you mentioned, open school night, our PTA, we have for the first time a very active PTA. We have a wonderful PTA co-president, and we, we measure uh, the amount of parents that are involved in that aspect. In addition, about 20% of our population are Engli English language learners, meaning they, they speak another language at home. Um, what we have done is we have hired a community associate uh, aligned to the language to increase communication in that aspect. So that's why we're seeing a greater involvement of parents. We're seeing more parents involved in the, in the school setting, in the school meetings, in parent-teacher conferences. So that's how we would measure that, that aspect of it. And the long term, what percentage is up to that long term? Uh, Title I is, is about 75%. Okay, we're going to finish on this side with, I got one last, okay. That's, we're talking about the receivership uh, plan that the government had before. Um, some assembly Democrats have, have reached out to the speaker saying that they're against it. Um, have you spoken with this speaker or heard his stance on that model versus yours for struggling? I certainly uh, offer the speaker my view, and I think what's clear is a lot of the assembly members think receivership is counterproductive on, in the context of a mayoral control system. It, it just doesn't make sense. We Look, <laughs> we've fought uh, a battle in this town to achieve a different approach to education. And this is an area where I agreed with Mayor Bloomberg. I supported mayoral control of education. I always said it had to be applied in a way that was respectful to communities uh, and to the real dialogue over education. Uh, and sometimes I don't know if the previous administration did that well enough, but the concept of mayoral control and the mayoral control law was absolutely positively right. It must be continued unless we want our school system to go back to what was. We used to have 32 individual district school boards, and we had a central board of education appointed by a number of different people. It was known for bickering and fighting and division and uh, paralysis, uh, kind of common uh, or similar to what a lot we see in Washington, D.C. right now. The 32 school boards, I was blessed to be on a school board we were very proud of that had a very good history. Sadly, there were school boards that were rife with corruption. And I have to say, you know, obviously everyone knows I, I've had my agreements and disagreements with Mayor Bloomberg. But on this one, he was totally right. We had a system that was rife with corruption. The local school boards were often ineffective. The central board was often paralyzed. We can't go back to that. And so if we know mayoral control of education is the right 
uh, tool for a real reform of our schools, and we see this all over the country, then the question is how do you actually allow mayoral control of education to work? If schools are put under state control, well, I'm sorry, with all due respect to Albany, I believe we know a lot more about what we need to do for our children than bureaucrats in Albany do. I think the notion of a, of a group of bureaucrats 150 miles away trying to determine the fate of our children sounds like a formula for disaster. So let's take the tools we have and apply them. What everyone in Albany had an obligation and a right to say to the city of New York is, show us a plan with real resources attached. We did that in November. And we are illustrating to you today just how urgently we are applying that plan. We mean business. <laughs> Student journalists, hold on a second, let me just go to these guys. Um, we are very focused on investing in our schools. Uh, we obviously believe that, as uh, the Assemblyman said, and he'll jump in in a minute, that we uh, deserve what the highest court in New York State said we deserve in terms of education funding, and that would have a transcendent impact on our schools. But even with the resources we have, we continue to make additional investments. You're also about to see a capital uh, budget come out where we're going to make extraordinary new investments in education. Uh, last year, we went to Albany and got specific funding for pre-K, and starting in September, we're going to have absolutely universal pre-K. We're going to keep ensuring we get that funding. So it's partly what we are doing with our own resources. It's partly what we are getting from Albany through our efforts and the support of the people of the city, and it's partly what we should get if the CFE decision were actually honored. Just on, on the comment about uh, a couple of Assembly Democrats uh, wrote against it, it's, it's not just a couple of Assembly Democrats. It's almost unanimity uh, in the Democratic conference uh, against uh, the receivership. As I said, unfortunately, there's a Senate and a governor, you know, and there's always compromise. But if it was up to the Assembly Democrats, uh, you know, uh, I don't think any of the governor's proposals uh, on education uh, would, would go through, but uh, certainly not the receivership. Do you have one other student journalist? Yes. Um, what are your plans to increase teacher retention in struggling schools? Well, thank you for asking, because I think teacher retention, again, I'm going to be talking a lot about this in the coming months and years. Teacher retention really is one of the most central questions uh, in the education debate, and yet it's not talked about. It's just, you know, educators know about it. Uh, you know, you can look far and wide in our mainstream media and try and find a serious discussion of teacher retention. You will be looking for quite a while. So we're going to push this issue very, very hard. I think uh, it is truest, perhaps, in the schools that are having the most trouble, but I think it's actually transcendent across the system, meaning I think the challenge of teacher retention is system-wide. It's very tough work. Here's the essence of the problem. It's very tough work. Uh, people who do it do it because they're true believers, the vast majority. Again, are there some bad apples? Are there some people who shouldn't be in the profession? Yes, and we're going to move them out. But the vast majority who do it believe in the work, but it's still grueling work. It's very challenging work. You're talking about, obviously, a lot of kids who come from very disadvantaged circumstances, a lot of kids whose first language is not uh, English, and 171,000 kids who happen to have special needs. A lot of those special needs make it tougher uh, to support and educate those kids. You know, into, that, into that fight go the teachers uh, trying to make a difference. Uh, you have to be very, very strong to want to do that year in and year out. And also, you need a lot of support. Uh, until very recently in this city, teachers were being attacked on a regular basis by the leadership of the school system and the city. Uh, we've changed that. We support our teachers, and they know it. Uh, until recently, teachers were not getting the kind of support for teacher training. And again, if you're a professional, you want to keep getting better. That training makes a world of difference. We've doubled down on teacher training. Also, until recently, teachers have gone years and years without even having a contract which is not a great way to keep professionals in any profession. Now they have a contract going years ahead. So I think we are seriously addressing teacher retention by trying to build the foundation for a rewarding work dynamic, but there's a lot more we'll have to do beyond that. Okay, we're going off topic. Off topic. Jillian. Uh, I was wondering <laughs> if you could weigh in on the results of the Israeli election and also on the comments that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu made about uh, Arabs coming out to the polls in droves, obviously gotten some criticism uh, from some of I well. haven't seen that particular comment. Uh, any Israeli citizen uh, can and should vote, so I don't know why there would be a criticism of uh, people exercising their right to vote in a democratic society. 
But uh, on the question of Palestinian statehood, I, I think there's many of us deeply, deeply disappointed. I'm profoundly disappointed that uh, a consensus view uh, held for years, oh, do we let them go? Good. A consensus view held for years uh, by uh, so many leaders in Israel and around the world, and certainly by the government of the United States of America, if anything actually had uh, some bipartisan agreement, it was that there had to be a two-state solution uh, in, uh, in that region of the world. Uh, for an Israeli prime minister to say literally overnight we're not going to pursue a two-state solution anymore is seismic. And it's a huge step backwards uh, for peace in the region. And it's not good for the relationship between Israel and the United States. I think it was a huge mistake and a very regrettable one. But, uh, you know, I guess that's what he believes. Staten Island's deer population has exploded. Okay, this is, this is a, that's a little switch there. A little switch. Okay, camera two. Okay, go on. Staten Island's deer population about Probably three. Amy Horowitz in charge of the deer problem, too. <laughs> so the population has increased about 3,000% in six years, and as a result, poaching has become a problem on the island, and as recently as Poaching? Last, in what sense? Like, uh, I'll explain. Um, in okay. the fall, a man was arrested in what was the first, believed to be the first uh, deer poaching arrest in New York City history stalking deer with a bow and arrow near a city playground. Mm. And islanders have also reported that they've seen deers without heads and antlers, presumably being taken as trophies, and the state has actually set up a kind of a unit to deal with this problem. I was wondering if you could comment on the deer population, like any concern about this? So, and yes. It would be non-retention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deer non-retention, yes. <laughs> I have not hunted animals. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with the details, but I can certainly give you the, the ground rules here. Anything that might endanger our fellow New Yorkers, such as someone hunting with a bow and arrow in the proximity of a school or any other habitation, we're obviously going to enforce on that very, very rigorously, and that will uh, be the job of the NYPD, and we'll work with the state on that. Uh, in terms of the larger problem and how we're going to regulate it and address it, I'm going to have to get back to you with more. But in the, the safety issue it creates for people nearby wooded areas, we take that very seriously, and we'll certainly do enforcement on that. Bob? Yes, uh, staying with fish and wildlife. Um, uh, <laughs> have I gone into a new dimension where all the questions are on fish and wildlife? Public advocate, Patricia James, uh, brought my attention to this question of the settlement that Governor Christie's entered into with Exxon, which would settle what was reported to be between $2.9 and $8.9 billion in natural damage against Exxon, which operates in, um, in New Jersey, but also affects the Newark Bay, which is something that you share. Mm -hmm. And we actually saw D.A. Don, Republican, and uh, Councilman Jen Peel get together that they're concerned about this. It's a public comment period for this settlement with the State Department of Environmental Protection. Is this something, uh, there is no, from my research, there is no Newark Bay Association like there is with the uh, okay. River. Let's get is to the punchline. <laughs> would you be concerned about this? Because environmental safety goes yes. without the settlement. We wouldn't be able to do things like what No, I'm absolutely concerned. First of all, I'm concerned because if a company, in this case Exxon, has created damage to the environment and public health, they have to compensate for it. They have to uh, make it right. Uh, we saw that with the BP oil spill in the Gulf. We've seen that many times with the, the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. There's supposed to be a rigorous process for ensuring that the environment is restored. I don't know the details of this settlement, but if the uh, dollar figure is so low that the work can't be done, I'm very uncomfortable with what that means for the people of New York. Uh, and you know, we'll certainly look into it further and decide what course of action we want to take. Provide us with an update into the case of the young woman who was killed by the flying plywood uh, in the West Village. So it's a very, very sad situation. I'm sure everyone has seen that she was, you know, soon to be married and had just gotten to the city in the last year, and it's, it's just tragic. Um, what we do know is uh, the site has been closed down in terms of any work there by the Department of Buildings. Uh, investigation is underway. There have been some violations offered, but we still don't have a full picture of why the plywood came loose and why it could cause so much damage uh, to this poor woman. So 
We'll have more on it soon, but certainly no work will happen at that site until these issues are more deeply resolved. Right there. You. Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for allowing Muslim children to take a, a holiday day off. I'm also coming from a Bosnian community that is growing up in this neighborhood. And a teacher might know we are building a youth center oh, just across the street of this school. It's about to be uh, done in one month. We would like you to visit one day a thank grand you. opening. And our goal is to work together to save our children. Thank you. I'm a Bosnian refugee, came into this country 20 years ago. You're going to interrupt you, though. I appreciate it. Do you have a question? I just want to thank you for everything thank that you, you have done. And Very much support. appreciated. We're going to come to you last. Very much appreciated. Go. One more. Second. We'll go to this, and we'll, go, we'll all do two, and we'll go there. Okay. There's a jobs report today showing that New York City um, accounts for more, a higher percentage of the state's jobs, uh, I believe, than, than ever before. Um, it went up from about 43% in 2004 to about 47% now. Um, I'm just wondering if something like that might actually give you some kind of leverage in Albany as you're asking for more re re resources where you can point to the fact that the city is, is contributing so much. And I'm also wondering what, how much credit do you think your, your credit predecessor, Mayor Bloomberg, deserves for that? So a couple of things. One, um, I think it's quite clear we make a huge economic contribution to the state of New York. And the strength of New York City uh, does so much for the whole state. And the fact that we are growing economically is good for the state of New York. It's good for all the people of the state of New York. So that constant progress uh, will uplift the whole state. And yes, is also a rationale for why uh, our, needs, uh, our needs deserve to be addressed, particularly if they're based on a judicial decision from years ago. Uh, on the uh, question of the economy, I think uh, I would say it like this. I think Mayor Bloomberg did some important things to foster economic growth, particularly, for example, with the technology sector. I think all of us should be humble when we're local officials about the impact we have on economic growth. We're part of the equation. Uh, international and national economic trends are, are huge factors. The decisions of individual companies that often have nothing to do with public policy are a huge factor. Uh, but I think local officials can make the situation that much better or that much worse by their actions. So I certainly credit uh, Mayor Bloomberg with having fostered some of the growth that we see, again, particularly in the technology sector. We believe our policies will build upon that and deepen it. But I think any local official should always recognize that they are just one part of a much bigger uh, economic growth equation. Okay, I had one more. Was it Sally? So, um, and then I'll... Sunday the MTA fair is going into effect. I was just wondering if you have any updated plans on your capital plan to increase money for the MTA. Why Sally? You know we don't talk about the capital plan before it comes out. Thank you for asking. The capital plan will come out in April, and we will address that issue at the time. We're certainly con you know, concerned about the future of the MTA. As I've said, I think Albany, which will go ahead of us, needs to take the situation much more seriously. Their uh, commitment so far to the MTA is far less than is needed, and Albany controls the MTA. Uh, but we are, will address what we believe we can do as well in the capital plan in April. Last call for you. Go. <laughs> Do you have anything to say to the critics of your affordable housing plan who say you could be placing several residents and proceeding too quickly with the zoning? And as a follow-up, what would be the cost of one of these houses to own? The cost? Of one of these houses to own. To own. Well, we're not generally doing home ownership. First of all, we're generally doing rental. Uh, that's much more cost efficient. That's where we're putting the vast majority of our energy. Um, we can get you the plan, but I think the simple way to say it is that it's an affordable housing plan for people of a variety of income levels who need affordable housing. Uh, a swath of the plan is devoted to people who make 20000 or less, another set to 40000 or less, and so on and so on. Um, so the idea is to create truly affordable rents because for so many people in this city, uh, their current rents are you know, a third of, yeah, too high, but a third of their total income, even in many cases more than half of their uh, net income. So. Uh, the plan will produce 200,000 units over 10 years, all affordable. For those who say uh, or allege we're going too fast, I would say there's no time to wait. We have so many people who cannot afford to live here. We've got to protect the economic diversity of our city and create opportunity. 
but we have added into our plan protections for local residents to keep their affordable housing in place. And uh, we believe that if the city comes in and manages the development process, uh, rather than just letting private market forces manage it, that we can guarantee affordability and guarantee uh, that people have opportunity. The alternative of doing nothing is much, much worse because it means, as we've seen in many communities, uh, that development and gentrification will displace many people. Our approach is a specific response to that history and will allow us to make sure that people can uh, remain in their neighborhoods. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.